Hey, it's Fletch with the Avaya Podcast Network at the NINA 2013 Conference and Exposition in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we're sitting down with Christian Vogler, who is the Associate Professor and Director of the Technical Access Program at Gallaudet University, and also a colleague of mine who served on the FCC's Emergency Access Advisory Committee, putting together some important work. Uh, for access for people with disabilities. Christian, welcome to uh, the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, nice to meet you here at the conference. For those people who don't know who Gallaudet is, can you explain what their job is and what their role is? Well, overall, uh, Gallaudet University is a university specifically for deaf and hard of hearing people to attend. Uh, and the main major language used on campus is American Sign Language. So you do have a lot of people who are deaf and hard of hearing who are students there. I teach in the Department of Communication Studies. That's where specifically I teach. And then we work with access to for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Now the major part of my job is doing research regarding accessibility for people with disabilities who are deaf and hard of hearing regarding emergency phone calls and emergency access. And basically it all in, involves me looking in the ways that communication can be accessible for people who are deaf and hard of hearing regarding emergencies. And I've met a lot of people who use all types of technology uh, daily and trying to find ways to make that accessible to 911 is what I do. One of the things that I noticed um, when I was at the EAC meetings, everything was videotaped and closed captioned. And one of the things that I saw on the very first meeting I was there, when someone would talk about a peace app, the closed captioning would say peace app, the word peace AP instead of PSAP. So even that technology was not 100%. And what I immediately realized was Again, someone with a hearing disability having to rely on captions wasn't even getting the full, complete message, um, even with technology that was available. And uh, that really shocked me as someone who was never exposed to that before. Yeah, that is true. That is a large problem. And you mentioned captioning, not only captioning, but also having to rely on sign language interpreters. There have been times when I've had interpreters who know nothing about the topic that we're discussing, and that makes it difficult. The deaf or the deaf person may be signing something. The interpreter has to interpret what the deaf person is signing, and they don't understand the topic, and that causes communication breakdown. So it, it just takes continuous work on trying to make sure that the interpreter knows the terminology, knows the subject matter, knows the person they're interpreting for, knows the style that the deaf person uh, uses when they communicate. There's so many things that uh, really qualifies an interpreter to be able to work with someone on an ongoing basis and that's really what needs to happen for uh, just interpretation to to be successful. So I have seen a lot of areas where mistakes have been made regarding phonetics. Things sound alike but they mean two different things. It may be saying one word and the interpreter hears something else. So because of phonetics, it also affects the captioner. The captioner hears something and they type it and that causes that that error that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, and I think on some of the telephone calls um, during those meetings, it came out where the captioners, but the transcript was wrong. They were awful. Yeah, they were. It was awful. <laughs> it was. The first time I read one of those, I could not believe that you were getting anything even close to what we were even talking about. It was just absolutely horrible. So when you think about that in a 911 right. environment, um, one of the things that I think came out that was interesting was someone who needs interpretation wanted direct access to a 911 call taker with an interpreter on the line. The way it works today, the 911 call taker doesn't really have direct access to the caller. They don't see what's going on in the background. They don't even hear that. That's right. Um, and unless you sign it, they cannot 
interpret, which I think is horrible. That's right. You're right. That that is a big problem, and really the two two issues related to that. The PSAP can't see the caller that's signing, and then the problem a lot of interpreters have who work for the relay service centers and with that system who receives the call, the 911 call, they <laughs> they freak out. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do with an emergency call. They may not have had the experience or the training to handle a 911 call that way. So. A uh, deaf person calls 911, the interpreter is stressed out, they don't know what to do, how do I handle this situation, and then they connect to the PSAP, and if I'm stressed as the caller, the interpreter's stressed, think about the risk of communication really being just messed up in that whole situation. It takes a lot of training, and that's what needs to be done so they can be professional and be able to handle a call like that. And interpreters just don't get the type of training uh, the 911 call centers get on how to stay calm during emergencies. So our committee, the EAC, has been working on trying to improve that situation. And one of the major recommendations we've had is to have training for interpreters regarding 911 situations and 911 calls. Uh, it's not in place yet, so we're hoping that will be uh, implemented sometime in the future. Well, and the interpreter has to be involved in uh, the next in communication direct communication with the PSAP, meaning that to have a three-way call with an interpreter, the person should be able to call the PSAP directly, and then the interpreter is pulled in by the PSAP. That would be the most effective way. And I think that's also a better use of uh, availability of resources. I may not need to have a an ASL dispatcher in every center, but if there was one made available regionally, they could be brought in to the various centers virtually as needed, or even a, a contracted company brought in as needed. Um, you know, it's that collaborative environment. And you know, I presented on that. That was one of the, the things that we brought to the table as Avaya. There's a whole conferencing environment yes. here um, that can really expand the functionality that's available today. So, um, what, what's your overall view of, of our work after well two years we were working on this? Are you are you happy? Overall, I am happy with the EAC, and I've learned a lot about, uh, especially all the members on the committee. Uh, we've learned about a lot about each other, a lot of information we've gathered and shared with others. It was interesting having all the different perspectives from everyone on the committee to share and come up with the recommendations we brought up, so I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, honestly, just happy overall that we were all able to work together and came out with a good result because we did have some disagreements and some arguments at times but we worked through those situations and the chicken salad sandwiches at lunch were very good <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> so we're we're sitting down talking with christian vogler who is i had to write this down because there's no way i can remember this the associate professor and director of the Technology Access Program at Gallaudet. A very noble position to have. Again, your business card must be huge to be able to get that on the front of it. Thanks for sitting down and, and talking with us or signing with us here, and thanks for getting that message out to the folks. I really do appreciate it. It's an absolute honor. Oh, and thank you. You're listening to APN. The Avaya Podcast Network. Find us on the web at avaya.com slash APN.